Wonderful. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Taylor Clem with UF IFAS Extension here in Alachua County, Florida. Um, and we're currently in Gainesville, Florida, but I know that we have a lot of people from around the state and even some other parts of the country that are joining us today. So I think it's important to note that as part of our Gardening for Butterflies program, that a lot of our recommendations are specific for uh, Alachua County or this North Central Florida area. But if you're in uh, the state of Florida, always or anywhere in the United States, feel free to reach out to your local county extension office that's associated with your land grant university, because they'll have additional resources to talk about uh, gardening for butterflies for you. But um, as part of our program today, we have Kara Ward. She's one of Alachua County's Master Gardener volunteers, and uh, she's going to take us through today's presentation. And feel free to put any of your questions in that Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. And Carol, feel free to take it over from here. Okay, thank, thank you. Very you. Much. All right. Thank you and uh, welcome everybody. Um, I'm happy to participate in this online seminar series. Um, today I'm going to try to give some very general information about what you need to have a uh, successful garden for butterflies. Um, but as Taylor mentioned, I'm also going to go through some specifics for those of you that live in North and Central Florida as far as the plants go. Um, <clears throat> Oops. Well, Taylor, this is not. Oh, just click on it and it should now. Uh... There we go. Okay, there we go. Sorry. sorry. I tried That's the arrows fault. and it wasn't working. <laughs> um, so sorry about that. Uh, so the, the main objectives of what I want to try to cover today is I am going to talk about uh, uh, butterflies that are found here in Florida. And I'm going to talk about their host plant. So I'll go through a moment, the life cycle of a butterfly and what we mean by a host plant. Um, I'm going to talk about native versus non-native, both host and nectar plants, and the advantages and disadvantages of my, why you might want to plant native versus non-native. Um, I will talk about uh, two of the Florida-friendly principles. While there are nine of them, certainly if you are gardening for butterflies, you are attracting wildlife. A lot of the plants that you use not only attract butterflies, but birds as well. Um, and I will also emphasize the right plant in right place. So when we talk about these different plants, you're gonna to need to consider what you have in your yard. You know, is it sun or shade as far as light requirement goes, dry or moist, the type of soil, et cetera. Because if you wanna be successful, you have to put the right plant in the right place. So why butterfly garden? I mean, I think there's lots of obvious reasons for why one would want to butterfly garden. But as um, I'm sure you're aware, butterflies are great pollinators. You know, there's a lot of concern today for the decline in bees and other pollinators. And butterflies are certainly an important part of the pollination uh, process. They provide food for other organisms. Um, I love birds as much as I love butterflies. And while um, I don't particularly like watching geckos and spiders eat adult butterflies, um, the birds need those caterpillars to feed their young. So before they fledge from the nest, it's very important that those caterpillars are around as a wonderful food source for our birds. They're fun to watch, obviously. That's one of the main reasons I do it. I just enjoy sitting outside and watching all the butterflies and the birds and the beautiful flowers um, that we use to attract them as well. Um, a lot of the plants that we use to attract the butterflies will also attract birds and other beneficial insects. And that's one of the things I'll stress about uh, using native plants because the native plants are very important for supporting our beneficial insect population here in Florida. It's a very environmentally friendly thing to do. Um, again, by keeping those uh, native insects around, which are an, an important part of um, <clears throat> Our wildlife. And of course, it's educational. You know, um, almost all schools use butterflies to talk about complete metamorphosis. It's a fun way to teach your kids about metamorphosis as well. And uh, most kids enjoy watching the, the four different stages of the butterfly uh, life cycle. Um, and the butterfly is an indicator species for environmental stages, uh, changes. Uh, sorry, when I lived in Illinois, I participated in the Illinois Butterfly Monitoring Network um, because when there's loss of habitat, there's loss of butterflies. And it's a very uh, easy way. A lot of citizen scientists can participate in uh, different uh, butterfly monitoring programs. Okay. 
Um, to be able to understand why we plant the different plants that we do, I think we should go through the basics of the butterfly life cycle. Um, and as I mentioned, butterflies undergo complete metamorphosis. So they go through four different life stages. The adult butterfly is, of course, what we see and enjoy watching flying around and gathering nectar from our plants. But they are going to then lay their eggs on very specific plants, what are called the host plants. And so butter, each butterfly has uh, uh, several host plants that they will use. Uh, the eggs usually are around for three days to about a week, and then they develop into the larvae or what is more commonly known as the caterpillar. So the caterpillar is going to go through a number of different instar stages. They will grow uh, a, a large amount during the several weeks before they then go on to develop into the chrysalis. And the chrysalis, you can often find they, they kind of like to hide them. They put them in protected areas off of branches, off of eaves of roofs and such. Um, they last for about one or two weeks before they then uh, change into the adult butterfly and then the life cycle starts all over again. So the nectar plants are very important for the adult butterflies, whereas the um, host plants are important for the developing caterpillar. So to be truly a successful in butterfly garden, you, you really should ideally include both host plants and nectar plants. Um, a lot of times it's best to have nectar plants first, see what butterflies you have around based on that. Then if you wanna add the host plants, you can get those butterflies to stay there for as long as possible and go through several different broods. Um, include native plants. And I'm gonna go through later on some very specific examples of how using non-natives can actually be very harmful to some of these butterflies, um, especially as I said, the host plants. Those are two of the most important things. Now, some people might wanna include a water source. Um, the, the picture that you're looking there is actually pipe vine swallowtails that I saw while hiking in North Carolina a couple summers ago. And they're doing what is called puddling. And they get salt and minerals from the water that's found on the rocks or on sand. So uh, there are ways that you can make a little water source where uh, you can take like a, a pie tin and put sand on it and just have it get sprayed with water so that the butterflies can puddle. Um, I think it should be clear we don't want to use pesticides. Obviously, pesticides are usually very general. If you're going to split, spray your plants with pesticides, you're going to kill all those caterpillars and, and butterflies. So I think that's a pretty obvious thing. Um, ideally, you should try to include plants that flower at different times of the year. So I include a link here to a reference, and I took a screenshot to show you that what I like about this reference is it shows you the time of year for some of the different uh, plants and when they bloom. Um, I personally do this by, I like to go to nurseries probably every month, look to see what's blooming at the nursery, decide if there's room to put it in my yard so that I always have something flowering at, at one time of the year. Because in Florida, there are butterflies that can be found year round. Other ones are more limited to like March through October, but some of them are actually uh, year round butterflies. And you want to include a mix of different flower colors, shapes, and sizes. Some butterflies prefer the tubular flowers, like we see with the salvia. Some of them like more the composite flowers. Uh, some butterflies have to land, and so it has to be a larger flower that they can sit on, whereas other butterflies can just flutter and feed at the same time. Um, so variety is always nice. And then, of course, as I said, you want to make sure you put the right plant in the right place. So you have to look at your yard, see what, uh, how much sun and shade you get, uh, what your soil is like. You can send your soil out. Actually, uh, IFAS has uh, a way of testing the soil if anybody's interested. So you can determine if you have sand or clay, um, etc. So uh, in Florida, there are about 170 native butterfly species. Now, not all of these are in North and Central Florida, um, but a lot of them are. Most of them use nectar for food, but you should realize there are butterflies that don't use nectar. Some of them use uh, sap from trees rotting fruit. Um, if you've been like to the butterfly museum uh, at the UF Natural History Museum, you've or any butterfly garden, I'm sure you've seen where they put out uh, trays that contain rotting fruit in it, bananas, etc. cetera. Um, and some of them actually go to dung. Of course, you're not gonna do anything about that. That's naturally occurring. I often saw red spotted purples uh, in hiking in the woods because of the, the different coyote dung that's around that you can see them uh, resting on. 
Um, and again, please realize that the species of butterflies do vary as far as the shape of flowers that they use for their nectar sources. Okay, so there are, uh, as I said, about 170 species. I have picked out 15 common ones that I've seen in my yard uh, that I'm going to talk about is first I'm going to talk about their host plants and then later I'm going to talk about some nectar plants. So these are ones that I've taken photos of from my yard. <clears throat> and so this is a giant swallowtail. It happens to be on a pagoda plant in my yard. But remember, the larval host plant is the one it lays its eggs on, and that's the one that the caterpillar has to feed on. And for the giant swallowtail, a lot of us in Florida have citrus in our yard, and citrus is one of the main host plants for the giant swallowtail. Um, you can use wild lime if you want to use a native plant, or of course there's cultivated orange, lemons, and grapefruits. There are some non-citrus, common rue, which is an herb you could use. Um, and then if you have a wooded property, you might have hop trees, which they can also use as a host plant. The black swallowtail is probably one of the easiest ones to have a host plant for because it uses a number of different herbs, okay? Um, it uses fennel, dill, and parsley. And while these are non-native plants, they work very nicely. I always like to have an herb garden where I grow extra plants just so that the um, caterpillars can destroy it and I don't get upset that I don't have any more parsley in my yard. Um, and I have some pictures here of two of the different instar stages for the black swallowtail. You can see in the center picture, the, the caterpillars are small and dark with like a white saddle on them. And then on the left hand side, you see the larger one where it's getting close to where it's going to form its chrysalis to develop into an adult butterfly. And the black uh, swallowtail, actually the adult that you're looking at is using my firebush as a nectar plant. So if you want to do a butterfly garden and an herb garden, that is also a, a possibility. Next, we have the Palamede swallowtail. This is one that I've seen in abundance when I first moved to Florida five years ago uh, because I happened to move to a wooded property. And its host uh, plants include a number of different trees, the red bay, the sweet bay, and the sassafras. And I know I've seen both red bay and sweet bay on my property. Um, <clears throat> we are having, um, with some of these, there can be a problem because of a decline in our red bays. We've having a problem with the ambrosia beetle. And so again, that's why uh, we're concerned about a decline in, in these, but luckily there are some other host plants that they use. Next, we have the pipe vine swallowtail. This is one in my yard that happens to be using a blackberry lily as its nectar source. Um, the pipe vines <clears throat> um, are uh, in the genus um, Aristolochia. And there are several native species here in Florida, the Virginia snake root, the Dutchman's pipe, and the woolly Dutchman's pipe. Now, I have to say, when I first moved down here, um, at the time, I grew the calico flower, or A. elegans. Uh, since then, it has been listed, first of all, as an invasive plant. So that's one of the problems with it. I have since ripped that out, and I now am growing the woolly Dutchman's pipe. But there's another problem, not just that it can be invasive, but the fact that the butterfly will lay its eggs on it, and the caterpillars will feed on it. But a lot of the caterpillars will basically starve and not go on to develop into the full adult butterfly. And it's believed because it just doesn't taste right. It doesn't taste as good as the native species to them, so they don't eat enough to be able to undergo a complete metamorphosis. So please, if you can, use the native species in particular for the pipe vine swallowtail. Then we have the spice bush swallowtail, which gets its name because one of its larval host plants is the actual spice bush. Um, it can use some other host plants, sassafras, again, a, a small tree, as well as other uh, bay trees as well. Um, so again, if, if you have a wooded area or if you can grow spice bush as a way to, to get this to stay in your area. And here uh, I have a queen's wreath where one of them is feeding in my yard. And I also have a New Zealand tea rose. So I like to have a variety of ornamental plants to provide nectar. Um, here we have the tiger swallowtail. 
And again, you can see that its larval host is again mainly trees, okay? Uh, black cherry, ash, sweet bay, and tulip trees are all native here in Florida. And for those of you that uh, might be living in other uh, places, states besides Florida, these are native in a lot of other states as well. Um, and tiger swallowtails are pretty, pretty ubiquitous throughout the United States. And here, uh, again, is a picture of it in my yard um, using nectar from pentas, one of the one of probably easier uh, nectar plants to grow here in Florida. One of my favorites is the zebra swallowtail. Um, I do see it in my yard. I have to say that I've tried to grow the pawpaw, which is a small tree or large bush. Um, I, for whatever reason, have not been successful at growing this. I can try again, but um, nonetheless, there must be some around because it is native and I certainly do see zebra swallowtails um, flying around in my yard as well. Almost everybody is familiar with the monarch butterfly. Again, a lot of schools use the monarch as a way to demonstrate complete metamorphosis. Um, these were pictures from my yard. It, uh, you can see the chrysalis in different stages. The green stage there is an earlier stage. The dark stage uh, to the right of that is right before it emerged into the butterfly that you can see there. So that was hanging on the eve of my house. And then they like milkweeds and you can see one of the caterpillars there. And then the butterfly itself is on a Mexican flame vine. So there are a number of different native milkweeds to Florida. Um, there's the swamp milkweed, the white uh, swamp milkweed, and of course there's butterfly weed. And I highly encourage you to try to grow these plants. Once again, when I first moved here, one of the first plants I put in my yard was the Mexican or tropical milkweed, right? It grows really well. It grows a little too well. And the problem is it doesn't die back in the winter here. So if you do have it, I recommend you do cut it back because there's a, a real problem with the monarch butterfly and a particular protozoan uh, parasite called OE for short, or Ophryocystis electroscura. Um, this uh, affects the butterfly depending on how heavily it's infected. So if there are a few parasites living on this butterfly, it's fine. But if it keeps feeding off of an infected plant, which is what often happens with the tropical milkweed, the spores of this protozoa come out onto the leaves and then they lay their eggs and then the caterpillars will eat those spores and they can develop a very heavy load. And if they do, first of all, a lot of them won't even fully develop into the adult butterfly or they'll be deformed. Um, and the problem here in Florida, this is not a problem like in the northeastern US because there they don't have the plants last year round. The monarchs uh, uh, migrate as they are supposed to. The problem is really in Florida, greater than 50% of our population is infected. And that's mainly because they're staying around with this all year blooming tropical milkweed, whereas the other milkweeds die back in the winter. So I am eventually ripping out all my tropical milkweed and I've been replacing it. I've had success with the white swamp milkweed the most and I have some native butterfly weed that just pops up on my property, I'm happy to say. I think it's important to, you know, if you have like that tropical milkweed, um, we encourage, we've been encouraged people to just make sure you keep cutting it back Yep. the cooler time of the season and then it'll bounce right back up in the once we start to warm up in springtime and that'll help so you yep. can keep it until ideally you could replace it with one of our other natives right right mm -hmm. yes yeah, so that's what i try to do is go around cutting it because um it, it will just keep going now this winter is one of the coldest winters we have in a while so it actually has died back but in the past mild winters it has not died back at all um, the queen butterfly also uses milkweed plants as well um, the monarch butterfly tends to be um, around here uh, year round. And even though the queen I've read is supposed to be, I, I usually see it a much more limited uh, time of year, but it uses the same host plant. Oh, and I also should mention that milkweed is not only the host plant, but it's also a good nectar plant as well. <clears throat> the golf fritillary uh, is seen here. Uh, the caterpillar is feeding on one of my passion flower vines. I have the corky stem passion flower in my yard, um, but there's a number of diff different passion flowers, the may pop, yellow passion flower, corky stemmed. And this is an, an interesting plant because this plant is a host plant, 
for the golf fritillary if you grow this plant in full sun. However, you can also grow this plant in the shade. So if you want to just grow one host plant and have more than one type of butterfly, you could take this plant, plant some in the shade and some in the sun. Because in the um, shade, you'll see instead it's the host plant for this zebra longwing. So the zebra longwing, which is our state butterfly, you can see the caterpillars there are, are very white in color um, versus the orange color of the uh, golf fritillary. And I don't know if you can see on the, the picture at all. I did try to get some of the different stages. Um, yeah. Uh, so on this one, when I went back, you can see some of the smaller caterpillars next to the large one, and some of the different instar stages uh, versus the, the large uh, full grown caterpillar getting close to forming its chrysalis. Um, so this is the zebra long wing, the Florida state butterfly. And here's the one I mentioned, the red spotted purple. The red spotted purple uh, uses black cherry as its host plant, again, a native tree. Um, but you will not find those uh, landing on your uh, nectar plants. Uh, this one was in my yard. You can see it's actually sitting on some dung. Okay, And so this is the ones I often see in forest reserves uh, rather than uh, on your nectar plants. <clears throat> so then we have the cloudless sulfur. Um, right now I show you just the adult on one of my fire spike plants. It has um, a couple of different host plants. There's the partridge pea, which is an, a native, or there's um, some senna species, species. Now with senna, I will go through when I talk about that. Um, it's important that you try to do a native. Um, so senna lugastrina is one of the native sennas that you could use as a host plant. Then the buckeye, I always find this um, butterfly very beautiful. Uh, two of its host plants are also two very pretty plants, the wild petunia, Riella carolinensis, and the twin flower. Um, <clears throat> and the white peacock, I have often seen this if you've ever gone out to Sweetwater. I assume because it's Sweetwater, it has the water hyssop. Now, in my yard, I do grow some turkey tangle fog fruit. Now, a lot of people consider this a weed, and it is rather weedy looking. It has some very small white flowers. Um, I'll show it in a, in a later slide. Um, but it is a host plant, and so I basically use it as a ground cover, as you'll see in my butterfly garden. So that is my 15 butterflies. So I'll first start talking about some of the host plants and then we'll get into the nectar plants. So again, uh, the, the non-native host plant, which is a fine one to grow are your herbs. And those are your parsley, dill and fennel. Remember those are good for the black swallowtail. Um, <clears throat> now Christmas senna is another one. And Christmas senna is a nice, uh, native plant and it's Senna bicapsularis. But I do wanna give you a little bit of warning. This is a picture, I love this plant because it's one of those that blooms in the winter time, at Christmas time, winter, you'll see all these bright yellow flowers and the cloudless sulfurs love this plant. Um, it grows in full suns, rather small bush type tree. Um, but there are a lot of invasive Senna uh, species. And unfortunately, they can be hard to, to tell apart. I do have a link on here to an article that was written by Mark Frank, our extension biologist and master gardener. And he tells you how to distinguish between um, the Senna bicapsularis and the invasive Senna, uh, Senna pendulum. Um, and it's not that easy to do, but you can do it. You can count the number of leaflets. It's three leaflets versus four to seven. So there are ways to tell this apart. So I just act tell you to exercise caution because I know when I bought mine, it was labeled Christmas Santa, but it's not. <laughs> um, and again, I'm briefly going to mention trees because I think most people are more interested in flower gardens here. Uh, but if you do want to plant some trees or, or you can check trees on your property to make sure you, you might have these and leave them there. Black cherry is a great native tree for both the tiger swallowtail and the red spotted purple. Again, I mentioned the red bay for the palamedes and spice bush and the pawpaw for the zebra. Um, so again, there are a lot of different trees that you could uh, have in your yard um, that can act as a host plant. 
But most of you, I think, are interested in the herbaceous plants, right? Some of some of the pretty flowers that you can put in your yard, either as host plants or as nectar plants. And so the uh, host herbaceous plants that are native that I'm going to talk about are listed here. And I'm going to go through uh, each one. <clears throat> So the twin flower, it's a pretty little plant. Uh, you can use it as a ground cover because it's only about one foot tall. Um, it flowers, as I said there, in, in the spring to summertime. It's quite versatile as far as the amount of sun that it likes. And it's the host plant for the common buckeye. So this is a pretty little plant that you can have in your yard um, if you want to keep a bu buckeyes around year, year round. Okay, and a lot of people in Florida here grow your passion flowers because passion flowers are beautiful in and of themselves. And again, the caterpillars will eat the leaves on it. Um, it does tend to die back in the winter, um, especially this year, um, but it can bloom for a large part of the year. And as I mentioned before, this is a host for two different butterflies, the Gulf fritillary and the zebra longwing, depending on if you plant it in full sun versus partial shade. So this is the turkey tangle fog fruit. Again, it's not a very pretty looking plant. It has some rather insignificant small white flowers, but it is a good nectar, nectar source um, as well as being the host plant for the white peacock and another butterfly I didn't talk about, the Phaon crescent. Um, so you can see I have it with my mulch and I basically, I have a, a butterfly garden. I also just have plants throughout the yard, but in that garden, I use it as a ground cover. You do have to watch it because it will spread, but it's pretty easy. It's, its roots are pretty shallow. I just go and rip it up wherever it starts growing where I don't want. But if you're gonna grow it, you do have to do some maintenance. I'll just warn you, you'll have to do some maintenance if you have this growing. It, it, you often see it in parking lot and uh, you know gas station so again it's a very weedy type of plant so then we have our asclepias which are the different types of milkweeds this is your swamp milkweed again um, the host for both the monarch and the queen butterfly um, we had a lot of swamp milkweed in illinois i can't say i've had as much success growing it here in florida but again, it does uh, like a very moist environment. I think that's why I live a pretty dry, sandy environment. So I don't think it's ideal for, for growing the swamp milkweed. But if you have a wet area of your yard, it'd be a great plant to try to grow. Um, and, and again, it's, it's both the host plant as well as a nice nectar source. This one I've had a lot more luck with, the aquatic milkweed. Um, and even though it says moist, for whatever reason, I do have some irrigation on it, but it seems to be much happier uh, in my yard. It's a much smaller plant, which I also like. It only gets to be about two feet tall versus the um, swamp milkweed can be about four feet tall, can be a rather large plant. So you have to look at the area that you have and how much room you have. Um, but again, uh, just like the other, uh, any of the milkweeds, it's the host for both the monarch and the queen. So here's the pipe vine that I was talking Carol, about. Yes. Um, I had a question uh, going mm -hmm. back to the uh, milkweed. We mm -hmm. actually had a couple questions. We even had a mm -hmm. statement on uh, a live feed that okay. someone was asking about planting milkweed. And approximately how many do you plant or have you planted? Because I mean, if you have monarchs come into your landscape and they lay eggs, mm -hmm. they they can they really destroy your- Take stand. it down to the ground. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, do you have like a- a rule of thumb or something that you recommend for like how many do you have or do they just get completely destroyed every year? Well, you know, I haven't seen the aquatic milkweed get eaten totally to the ground like I do the tropical milkweed. I mean, I think that's the thing that they really seem to love that tropical milkweed and they eat it to the ground. But of course, it always comes back. I basically have dealt with it by having it in different parts of my yard. So I don't have it all in one area. Um, and I have not had the aquatic milkweed getting eaten all the way down. Um, so, I mean, I just put like three plants in one part of my yard and three plants in another part of my yard. I tend to plant in groups of threes. Mm -hmm. That's so just you're just of kind guess. of spreading them out and you're noticing yep. that the aquatic doesn't die back as much. Right, so, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I know like you, there can be days where you have the butterflies come in and the larval, the larvae appear and, you know, no matter how much you plant, if they're very prolific, you know, yep. they'll, they'll destroy what you have, but. Yep. 
Yeah. Uh, those, that's one of those good problems. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I see people uh, sending out things on Facebook. Does anybody have any milkweed? I have all these caterpillars and they've eaten all the plants. But, you know, I, I also kind of look at it as, well, maybe there's some birds that will take advantage of all these caterpillars. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but uh, I try to do nature takes its course and they serve their purpose. Absolutely. Um, right. Thank you, Carol. Sure. Uh, so again, here's the pipe vine. Now, uh, the calico flower, the one I told you was the invasive one, has a gorgeous flower. This is a rather not real noticeable flower. You have to look for it. Um, but it's a nice twining vine. I have, you can see it's on chicken wire because I have it growing all over uh, my chicken coop area. It's perfect. It provides shade for my chickens. It goes up the wire. Um, and then I constantly get pipe vine swallowtails. Um, and so while it may be not the most beautiful plant, um, it's, it's uh, a, a lovely plant to have if you want to have those pretty pipe vines. Um, wild petunia is in the Ruellia uh, genus, Ru Ruellia carolinensis. Um, it's a, a small wildflower, only gets a couple feet tall. Um, <clears throat> and again, it's a host for two different butterflies, the buckeye and the white peacock. And I just mentioned, because most people are more familiar with the Ruellia simplex or your Mexican petunia, okay? Please don't use this plant. It is invasive here in Florida. It goes crazy. Again, um, I've made every mistake a gardener can make here in Florida. Again, one of the first plants I planted and now it's been totally ripped out of my yard. So I learn by the error of my ways quite well. <laughs> Okay, so now for those fun nectar plants. Um, I try to divide it up more into looking at ones that are in the sun versus uh, the shade. Um, and so these are native ones in the sun, all the ones that are listed here. Um, and again, I'm, I'm lucky in that I have 12 acres. So I have wooded areas and then I have this sunny uh, native area that I put a lot of these plants in. <clears throat> I, I love the Stokes Aster, right, which is which is shown here. Um, it can get three feet high, but that's three feet high, but that's usually the, the flower stalks. The plant itself seems to be fairly low growing and spreads out. Um, they have these beautiful purple flowers on it. You can see those are actually a type of dusky wing that's, that's on uh, this plant right now. Um, it can grow in a variety of areas, and that's what I like. It's quite versatile, so I have it in different parts of my yard. Um, and it can uh, reseed and spread, so I do like the fact that it can spread around. And then you have your Rudbeckia lance, lanceniata, the cutleaf coneflower. This is a taller plant. It gets pretty yellow flowers on it. Um, they can be, be quite tall, about four feet tall. Um, and the other thing I just want to mention in general, so, you know, I put on here that it, it's average to moist, but a lot of the native plants, one of the big advantages of them is you have to water, like any plant, you have to water to get it established. But once it's established, it's quite drought tolerant. And that's another big advantage of using some of these native plants as both nectar plants as and host plants. The salvia coccinea or your scarlet sage. I love the red tubular flowers. Um, so again, it's a perennial wildflower, can get several feet tall. Um, now this is a plant that you have to be tolerant to the fact that it will seed and it will just spread randomly throughout your yard. Um, you can easily rip it out. But again, if you're a gardener, we want everything neat in its place. This might not be the plant for you, but if you love red flowers everywhere, like I do, I just let it go crazy. Um, but everybody has what they like. And the other th reason I love this plant is because hummingbirds love it. And I love to watch the hummingbirds. They come to this plant as much as the butterflies do. Um, there are some other cultivars that have different colors as well. Um, if you don't, if you want to do something besides red. One of my favorite bushes is the fire bush. Um, this is an evergreen shrub. It, it, this winter, it has completely died back. I've had other winters where it didn't die back at all. Um, you have to have room for it though, because this can be a, a fairly large uh, plant. Um, it can be anywhere from five to 20 feet high and five to eight feet wide. So it can get quite big, but it takes a lot of pruning so you can control it as well. Uh, it has the nice tubular flowers. Um, I have a video of butterflies just flying all over this plant, um, so I love it. And again, the hummingbirds love it. And it also forms berries in the fall, and the birds love the fruit. 
Um, I have cardinals and stuff come get it, but I also have chickens, um, as you might have known, because I talk about my chicken coop. And when I let my chickens out, they make a beeline for the fire bush and pick off all the berries off of it. So it's a good food source for other birds as well. Um, your purple cone flower, your echinacea, purpurei, um, it's a beautiful looking flower. Um, again, it's, it's a perennial that's a couple of feet tall. Uh, one of the things I really like about this plant is while it's, it's a good nectar plant, but also it produces nice seed heads uh, in the fall. And again, a lot of the birds, goldfinches, etc., love to eat the seeds. You get a two for one attracting both birds and butterflies at the same time. Then we have our blanket flower. Um, again, this one readily seeds as well. So, you know, if you want to do like a general wildflower garden, this is a great plant to put in there. Uh, you could put it in there. There's Coreopsis you can see behind it, another native I will talk about. So it will reseed. And again, it's very drought tolerant. Once you get established, you can just let it go um, and it'll keep coming back every year. So the Coreopsis is the other nice wildflower that if you want to do a wildflower garden, its common name is the uh, tick seed. And again, this is the Florida State wildflower. Some of these you might see they use along roadsides or trying to get away, do away with a lot of the grass and mowing and put wildflowers, which I think is a great idea, especially if they are used by the butterflies. Um, and so it has a, a pretty yellow flower. Some of them have some orange in it as well. And then you have your different sunflower. So there's a variety of them. They're all in the helianthus genus. Um, there are many species that are actually native to Florida. Uh, this one is the narrow leaf sunflower they have in my yard. Um, and this is, again, many, many butterflies I didn't talk about. This is a, a type of dusky wing, Horace's dusky wing, that is found on the uh, sunflowers in my yard. The obedient plant. Um, is a, a nice, rather small, only one to two feet tall, um, has pretty purple flowers on it, as you can see. Um, and again, it blooms in the fall. So again, to think about flowers at different times of the year, not just summer and spring. Um, again, once it's established, extremely doubt, uh, drought tolerant. And again, hummingbirds love those flowers as well. Hummingbirds like a lot of the different tubular flowers that they're gonna go to. Now, uh, as far as non-native uh, plants go, there are tons of them, okay? <laughs> um, I listed, again, these are some that I have in my yard, and I'm going to talk about some of the pluses and minuses to some of these nectar plants. So I, I provided here a link to you to the Florida Friendly Plant Guide. Um, and I put there on the right hand side that that's just a screenshot of what you can find out about different plants in the in this uh, guide. And what I like about it is, first of all, it tells you whether it grows in north or central Florida. Um, it tells you what pH. So if you get your soil test, it tells you pH. It tells you about how much water it needs, how much sun it needs, and of course, whether it attracts butterflies or birds with those different icons that they put down there. So, you know, it's kind of fun to sort of flip through it and look for uh, plants that have the, the butterfly or the bird, um, if, or, or both if you want, and to find out general information. You know, I'm looking for plants that are full sun, and, and you can easily just go through and pick out some plants there. If you have room, I really love the, the different abelias. Um, again, there are lots and lots of different cultivars. I believe this is the Rose Canyon one that I have in my yard. Um, but they can get big. They're shrubs about six feet. If you ever go to Kanapaha in their uh, butterfly garden, or actually it's in their hummingbird garden, they have a lot of abelias. So again, hummingbirds as well. Um, so again, it, it tends to flower sort of uh, late summer, early fall. Um, and it's, it's just, I, I just love the flowers on it and it tends to get covered in, in both butterflies and hummingbirds as well. <clears throat> One of my favorite salvias, and I think it's just because I'm attracted to that pretty blue color, is the Brazilian stage, sage. Again, you have to have room. It tends to spread out, you know, it gets fairly wide, um, tends to be, mine's probably four feet wide and as tall as it is wide. Um, but again, it has those nice blue tubular flowers in it. Um, 
And I, I will say that, um, and something I should mention with some of these like this one, deadheading is really important. So again, if you don't mind deadheading, this thing will just keep blooming and blooming and blooming. If you don't deadhead, you're not gonna get as many flowers. So again, you have to know what type of gardening you like to do. If you like to go out with your clippers and deadhead, this is a good plant for you. Um, another one of those salvias, hot lip salvia. Um, this is a much smaller plant, so I have it in my little, my smaller courtyard. Um, you know, it supposedly can get four feet. Mine's never gotten that big. Um, and it can keep flowering uh, throughout the year until we get a frost. Obviously, it's done now. Um, and I, I do have this with irrigation on it, you know, and so that's what I have different parts of my yard, ones that I know need water. I put them in my courtyard area with set irrigation, others in the native area. I don't worry about that. Another salvia, I love salvias, um, is the Mexican bush sage. And again, it gets these uh, tall sort of uh, purplish flowers, these long stalks of flowers on them. Um, and it tends to bloom more late summer uh, and into the fall. Um, hey, and Carol, again, it also does well at deadheading, sorry. Um, yeah, you're mention you mentioned deadheading. Can you yeah. briefly explain deadheading? Briefly, okay. Well, <laughs> once you see the flowers have died on that stalk, I take my little sharp clippers, clippers and I just clip it right at the base of the dead flower, right? And then I'll get new buds and it'll flower again, right? So it's a, a fun thing to do if you really want to keep it blooming as long as possible. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Now this plant, some people hate it, some people love it. I'm one of those people that love it. Uh, Clarodendron paniculata or the pagoda plant. Now the reason why people hate it is because again, it can spread. It can spread by suckers. It can spread all over the place. I have it behind a little pond, so it doesn't spread anywhere. It stays contained right where I have it, right? So I don't have an issue with that. I know other people can get frustrated with that. But I mean, again, I always see it get covered with these giant swallowtails. A lot of the bigger butterflies love the big flowers of the pagoda plant. Um, and that's why it's one of my favorites. But uh, you definitely would want to put it in an area of your yard that you can contain its suckering ability to, to really spread. And that's why people feel the same way about the Mexican flame vine. Okay, the Mexican flame vine, um, you know, I have it go up a trellis. It obviously is, is a vine. Um, <clears throat> it can send out long runners though. Um, I just direct them up my trellis and if they start to decide they're gonna go somewhere else, I cut them off. You have to be kind of merciless on controlling this plant because it can really, really spread out uh, long, long tendrils. Um, but again, it gets covered with golf fritillaries in particular. They seem to really love this plant. Um, and so as long as you're, and this winter it died back. I think in the past, I've also learned uh, in Florida, you do wanna cut things back. And I wasn't doing that when I first moved here. I was just so excited about all the flowers and letting them keep growing, growing, growing. Now I've learned that a lot of them, they really do benefit that um, after you see them dying back, you, you, well, usually cut them back at the end of winter, not too early. You don't want to come off back too early. Um, so it's a, a good uh, nectar plant for a number of butterflies. And, and I also see the zebra longwing on this a lot. Pentas um, are probably one of the easiest grows. If you're a beginning gardener, this is a great plant to start with. It has lots of nectar, attracts lots of different butterflies. Um, it flowers for a large part of the year and it also comes in a variety of colors. So, you know, you can get red, white, pink, um, different types of, of pentas or the Egyptian star flower. Um, and I also do see hummingbirds come to this as well. Um, so if you can only pick one flowering plant, you want a relatively small, I mean, they, they can vary in size, but there are ones that are two feet, some of them can go up to four feet, but you can find one probably just fit into uh, your, your space. But they do like full sun, that is a limitation, they do like full sun. Now the stacky tarfetta are the different types of porter weeds or snake weeds. Once again, I started out with the non-natives, okay? So I started out by growing the Canyensis, um, which is the purplish one there on the right. And I've also done the Metabolist, the red one. Um, I now have added the native to my garden, the uh, Jamaicaensis. Um, it's a little bit smaller, much more controlled plant. So it's that small, more blue and white flower that you see there on the left. I mean, I love the porter weeds, but they can spread like crazy. 
Okay, so I have spent a lot of time ripping out uh, baby porter weeds that are showing up in areas that I don't want them. Um, you know, there is an invasive plant list for Florida. I believe they have listed as a caution as not considered invasive, but anytime you see that, you know that it might be over time, it can become invasive. So um, it sort of convinced me over time to keep switching more to doing natives as much as possible. But I love butterfly bush. It's not a native, right? But it's a beautiful plant. Uh, butterfly bushes can get quite tall, um, but I actually have this a dwarf variety here. I can't remember which it is, Raz something or other. Um, uh, so it only gets about three feet tall, so I can keep it again in a, a smaller area of my yard. You can have so many choices of the colors of flowers that you want on the butterfly bush, which is one of the reasons I really like it. Again, once it's established, it's drought tolerant and the hummingbirds love it as well as the butterflies. Um, <clears throat> and then the cigar plant, I just love the tubular flowers. I guess I'm just really kind of partial to tubular flowers and it sort of looks like a flame with the red and the yellow on there. Um, it can flower for a large part of the year. Um, so, you know, it's, a, it's another nectar plant that I enjoy having in my yard. Another type of kufia um, is the Mexican heather. This is a much lower growing plant. It tends to be more as a ground cover. It can spread out. Uh, most of them are sort of this purple lavender color. They do make a, a white variety as well, um, but it can bloom pretty much year round, which is one of the reasons why I like to, to keep it in my yard. I like to have a few plants that try to stay in bloom for almost all of the year. And it's versatile as far as sun and shade, so I can put it in different parts of my yard. Um, now, what about nectar plants if you mainly have uh, shade or part sun? Um, so uh, three of them that are listed here are the sweet spire, the farfugum, and the red uh, fire spike. Again, I have all three of these. Um, the sweet spire, Virginia sweet spire, produces these yellow flowers in the spring, right? And it's nice to have something for a lot of newly em emerging butterflies in the spring to have a nectar source. Um, you know, it's, a, it's a, a, a type of bush, it can sort of spread out quite a bit over time. Um, but, it, and it can vary as far as how much sun or shade. It does tend to like more water though. So that's my only hesitation about that is you probably need to irrigate this uh, if you're going to plant it. The farfugium, I love. Uh, the yellow flowers are for a relatively short time of the year in the fall, but I love, love the leaves, right? I just like the foliage itself. Um, so it is a nectar plant, but it's just a pretty plant to have uh, in your yard in general. Um, I have it in a pretty shaded area. It also tends to like a little bit moister soil though. And then one of my favorites, uh, again, tubular flowers, no surprise, is the red uh, fire spike. Um, it definitely did die back this winter. Um, it is totally dead in my yard right now, but it tends to flower more uh, late summer and fall through the winter. Um, and it really does best with just some part summer shade. It does not like full sun. I don't know why initially I planted it in full sun. I thought I had read that somewhere. It wasn't very happy. Um, so I've moved it into more shade and now it's quite a happy plant. And it tends to get covered with those cloudless sulfurs. I love the yellow butterflies on the red flowers. Okay, um, I just want to mention that there are not of uh, spring flowering trees and shrubs. Um, so I just sort of listed them here. I'm not going to go through all of them. Uh, Eastern red buds, I'm sure a lot of you have seen those pretty pink flowers in the springtime. The Dahoon highs, the Chickasaw plum has nice flowers as well as fruits, and same with their sparkleberry. Um, but the only one I want to talk about are the azaleas. Okay, so there are native azaleas here in Florida, which I have fallen in love with. Um, so they like uh, part sun to shade. Um, and I guess I fell in love with them because I went to one of the state parks here in Florida in the springtime and they had these native azaleas and they were just covered, I mean, covered in butterflies. Um, and so I keep, I, I started out with uh, the um, non-native azaleas in my yard and now I've been adding, I'm still keeping the non-natives, but I've been adding the native azaleas as part of it. And they're very pretty spring flowers, good for those newly emerging butterflies in the spring. Okay, so that's all the plants I was going to talk about. 
Um, if you're ready to plant, um, again, if you're not quite ready, it seems too much, too overwhelming, you can always start with a little container garden. As I said, you could start with an herb garden. You could put some pentas in a container, right? There's any number of ways to start small, see what butterflies you get. And again, you can start by doing the nectar plant, see what you get. And then if you want, try to add some host plants to keep them around. Um, if you're really anxious to get started, um, I do recommend you have your soil tested. So again, in that Florida friendly book that I referred you to, it does tell you about pH. So that's something I forgot to mention, like azaleas love acid pH, okay? I tend to have very sandy soil, which is not acidic at all, it's more alkaline. Um, so I'm constantly like uh, raking up pine needles and putting them around your my azaleas to make it a more acidic environment. So there are tricks that you can do to try to adjust the pH of your soil. Um, you definitely want to observe, you know, are you going to be planting in a sunny area, a shady area in different times of the years? Um, and you, again, you want to choose the appropriate plant for the location. So you want to know, are you going to be able to supply it with water or do you really need something that's drought tolerant, the type of light, the type of soil? Uh, and just general information, you know, if you're really new to gardening, anytime that you plant a new plant, make sure you dig a big enough hole. A lot of people don't dig a large enough hole. You want to very carefully remove the plant. A lot of times when you buy plants, they tend to be root bound. Um, I, I cringe every time I do it, but I finally do it that, you know, if you see roots circling around the bottom of the plant, that's not good for the plant. You want to actually cut those off. You can use uh, scissors or shears to remove those circular roots. And then when you plant it, again, you want to have it basically level with the soil. You don't step on it. You just put soil around it. Always, always when you first plant something, you have to water it to get it established. And in Florida, I think mulching, well, I'm sure a lot, many, it's very important to stop things from drying out uh, with our extremely hot weather. So um, I, I used a number of different resources. Jarrett Daniels is an expert in butterflies. I used his book, Your Florida Guide to Butterfly Gardening. I mentioned the landscaping guide. And um, there's some other Edis IFAS documents that I believe Taylor is going to provide uh, to you that you can uh, reference later on um, that I've referenced in my talk. And that is it. So thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Carol. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Yeah, so um, we had quite a um, we had quite a few uh, questions coming through the presentation. I know Christy and Cindy have been doing very well keeping up with those, but um, there's still some that kind of popped up and uh, some of them I think would be interesting to talk about. One that I okay. see currently is um, someone mentioned that they live in an HOA and that HOA is doing mm. pest control. Um, yeah. And do we have any suggestions with regards to that? Um, if you have any response, I'll let you go first. Then I got a couple notes that I could probably share with that. Uh, you know, I don't live in an HOA. I live in rural Florida out in Archer. <laughs> <laughs> so I really don't know how to address that. I purposely did not want to live in an HOA. Um, and mainly because I like to do gardening the way I like to do it. So whatever tips you have, please. <laughs> Yeah, so it can definitely be difficult. And um, when you're dealing with an HOA that is doing pest control themselves, um, some of the stuff that they're spraying, uh, depending on what it was, is, may not actually have any impacts on the butterflies themselves. But there are other systemic pesticides or insecticides that they could be uh, applying that could have impacts on those uh, insects. Yep. So one strategy that you can always do is um, you can always reach out to the management board or the HOA board and mention that you're having a pollinator area. And you can sometimes work with them and you can designate an area as a pesticide free zone and they will avoid and you can put like a little sign up and they'll avoid spraying those areas. Um, that can be that can be successful. Um, and then going back to one of the things that Carol said is you know, if they're spraying like the front yard areas, if you have the ability to do the butterfly or pollinator areas in the backyards where you might not have that HOA control, um, that might be a little bit better for um, the butterfly gardens because it could be reduced pesticide um, within that area. 
So that's a that's a really tough one, but I think it's important to address because that's a common conversation or discussion point that typically happens from uh, individuals that live within HOAs. Mm -hmm. um, and could you hit back on the slides, Carol, to kind of keep that reference sheet open? Yep, sure. Perfect. Uh -huh. Perfect. Um, so um, you mentioned earlier the soil test. Mm -hmm. um, we have the ability to do soil tests where you can learn about your percent sand, silt, clay, th that structure of your soil. You can also submit your soil tests um, to learn about like pH, nutrient availability, and uh, our soil testing lab. So a bunch of different county offices throughout Florida have the ability to do pH in the office, but in Alachua County, we actually have like the main soil testing lab on US campus. Uh, so what I'll do is when I, when I send out information about today's uh, class, like follow-up resources, I'll include that soil sample testing kit, like the, the form that you fill out. And that has the address for the actual uh, soil testing lab where you can send your soil test through um, the mail essentially or if you're around campus you can actually drop it off in the office periodically so that so i'll follow up with that one as a good okay. as a resource yeah so um and some of the resources i know some people came from south florida i saw some questions about that the Edis publication that we're going to share about butterfly gardening um, goes. It talks all about uh, different plants, hosts, and nectar plants throughout the entire state, not just north and central. But it'll give a lot of South Florida examples that we do not cover. In yeah, the Florida presence. Friendly Guide too. Uh, they list mm -hmm. whether it's North Central or South Florida. Yep. Yeah, the Florida Friendly Guide is a great resource, and I think all the apps are going to be free soon too. <laughs> that they have with a floor friendly landscaping program. Um, okay. So let's see. Do you do any soil amendments, Carol? Like, do you all compost and do you bring that into your? Oh, uh, yeah. We, we, again, having chickens, we certainly use the chicken oh. manure and mix and make compost. Um, I'm always collecting pine needles. And oak leaves, you know, I uh, heard about your oak leaf tea for citrus green, so we're looking into doing something like that as well. Um, but yeah, we, we definitely amend, um, you know, I do buy compost, but we also make compost. And of course, mm -hmm. I, I'm big on mulching, you know, we mulch a lot of areas, not only for the moisture, but to try to do weed control as well. Um, yeah. So yes, and like, uh, you know, the I mean, blueberries, we didn't talk about, but the sparkleberry and some of those others, you know, yeah, sometimes you have to add acidifiers. Uh, yeah. To it. yeah. Yeah. And because I think with our really sandy soils, it's great that you can amend our sandy soils with some mm -hmm. compost or other materials like that, uh, because that can help with nutrient availability, soil yeah. moisture retention, and it can help make your garden be a little bit more successful if yeah. um, you have a very sandy soil which we clearly do. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> all right. What other questions that we have? Do you, um, do you use plumbago as a butter, as a nectar source? I don't know if plumbago is a... Uh, you know, I have it in my garden um, and I do believe I've seen butterflies on it. I, you know, I didn't list that one, but I, I certainly do grow it. Um, mm -hmm. So yes, it is. It is a nectar plant. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they're really good. They they are tough plants. I yes. like them, and I think they're pretty much. I mean, they're blooming year round. Yep. So um, and you and can get. Can you uh, find them more beneficial for bees than for butterflies? I have more bee activity on on the few that I have. So it's still beneficial, and they're pretty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're very pretty. <laughs> you can get blue or white. I have both. <laughs> So we had, we tossed uh, some of the questions I saw is like a lot of the, you know, the plants that we showed in here, a lot of them were just primarily full sun, but I know some of them do like that part shade or a mm -hmm. little deeper shade. Do you have any specific recommendations, Carol, for those shadier areas that might be nice to bring in some pollinators plants? Well, again, I, I love the fire spike. That's one of my favorite pollinator plants that I have mm -hmm. in, a, in a shady area. Um, I also have the passion vine growing in, in shade as well as in sun. Um, 
And again, I have, because my uh, lot is wooded, uh, you know, I, I do a lot of things on the edges. Um, so like the twin flower I have growing all along the edge, which is partial shade, you know, so a lot of them can take the partial shade. Um, it's not full shade, but um, I, I sort of put it on the border of the wooded area around my lot. Um, have you ever, uh, this is came from YouTube. Um, have you ever tried starting, have you ever tr started try starting milkweed or do you just do it from like I propagations? Did. did you do it from and seed I, or I the had, cuttings? I had no luck with seeds. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I tried it. It was not successful. I have a greenhouse and everything and I could not get it to germinate. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I buy the plants. I go to a lot of the native plant nurseries now uh, to get the uh, swamp milkweed or the white swamp milkweed. Um, yeah, I, I saw someone had posted in the chat. I was looking briefly about where to buy plants and not to buy plants. And I mean, I will say, you know, we do have a problem a lot with the big box stores using pesticides and stuff. And mm -hmm. so I do try to avoid that. You know, I tend to go to a lot of the local nurseries around here. Um, um, I, I find the people there are usually quite knowledgeable anyways, you know, they know as much about plants as me. If I have questions <laughs> about it, they can be very helpful in these smaller nurseries. So I, I like going there. Yeah, and there is, I think it's on uh, the Florida Association of Native Nurseries. Hmm? Their website, um, they have a directory that you can look at for native nurseries. Mm -hmm. um, so depending on where you're living, you kind of just type in where you're at and then you can find what native growers are within your area to kind of so you can see where they're at and then also find what they're selling um, and you know mentioning about like concern about pesticides in um, what you find at the retail nurseries um, Carrie you mentioned this is like or I, one thing I think about is when you go to these nurseries and you're concerned about how they're managing the plants in a nursery you don't mm -hmm. want to bring something back that has a lot of uh, systemic insecticides on them that could cause problems to pollinators mm -hmm. um one good indicator actually is aphids oh, so i never thought about that if if you go and you look in the milkweed like if they're if they have milkweed on the on the on the property and there's aphids on them more than likely they haven't been sprayed with a uh, insecticides so you can easily just kill them all by just smashing them um, mm -hmm. or just a, a light application of using like insecticidal soaps um, before putting them in your landscape and that can control the aphid problem but also could be an indicator that they haven't been sprayed with insecticides. And of course if you live in the Gainesville area you know the Natural History Museum uh, sells uh, butterfly plants every weekend uh, mm -hmm. for a limited part of the year. It hasn't started yet this year, um, but it's a great source uh, to get yeah. a lot of these butterfly plants. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Let's see. Let me open up the... Review the slide. Someone the asked on. about the butterfly life cycle. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's from the very beginning. But... The very beginning. Oh, so like what is... Um, Oh, so one thing just popped up that I see about insecticidal soap, but it did not work. Um, mm -hmm. I'd be careful using homemade insecticidal soaps because the soap that is typically used within, say, like our Dawn dish soap might actually have high levels of salt or sodium within them. And that can be more problematic to your plants than the insects themselves. So I recommend buying specifically formulated insecticidal soap because it's going to be using a soap that is safe specifically for your plants. Um, whereas like uh, your typical just house dish soap will not be uh, effective. Um, so I'm not sure someone asked about reviewing this. Um, I guess I can just briefly go over it. And if, this, if another question pops up, <laughs> they can ask. Uh, but the main thing is that uh, the adult butterfly typically only lasts for a, a few weeks. I mean, they do vary with the specific butterfly. They are the ones that are flying around and going to your nectar plants, but they have to land on the host plant to lay the eggs on it or very near it. Um, the eggs take usually anywhere from three to seven days to develop into the larvae. Uh, and the larvae again, or the caterpillars, they go through a number of different instar stages. 
Um, and so this can last um, like three to five weeks, right, where they go through the different stages. And I was going to mention that. So if you do grow like parsley and dill and stuff, you do want to look <laughs> before you're going <laughs> to eat it to make sure you don't have those little instar stages because they can be quite small when they're first starting out. Um, and then the, the caterpillars metamorphose into the chrysalis. Uh, which typically lasts um, one to two weeks, depending on the particular butterfly. And then it emerges into the adult. And the, and the adult, you know, it has to dry its wings for a couple hours typically before it can start flying again. Um, if you've ever seen them release butterflies at the butterfly garden, you've probably have, have witnessed that before. And you can um, watch them dry their wings. Yes. Yep, yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> like, I loved they have it all when the they were windows. outside my kitchen window. I mean, I was just sitting there washing dishes and watching the butterfly emerge over time. It was very fun to, to watch. <laughs> and then I have to stop my dogs from trying to eat them while their uh, wings are drying. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Let me see what other questions, please, because um, we're getting a bunch of things come in. If you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A. It's easier and for someone us. Someone asked about my name. Uh, the last name's Ward. It was on the first slide, I swear. <laughs> there, there's oh, my name. <laughs> here we go. I'll, I'll add it to the tag. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Um, what happens to butterflies in winter? Well, I mean, some of them can overwinter, but a lot of them die or they migrate. I mean, uh, and, and some of them can overwinter in the chrysalis stage too. So it just, it varies what butterfly and where you live as to how they overwinter. <clears throat> so one question I see is, relates to mulch. Um, like, do we have any preferred mulches here in Florida? Pine byproducts <laughs> <laughs> or natural yeah. leaf litter. Um, that's going to be best. Avoid yep. rubber mulch, um, cypress, cedar mulches. Um, the rubber mulches are just bad environmentally. And then the cypress and cedar, they're unsustainably harvested. Um, other good ones could be like a malaleuca um or a eucalyptus since those are invasive species so they are chipped up and all that stuff and they they don't propagate from that but they're good mulch substitutes yes i tend to use pine bark it, i use whatever's laying around <laughs> well yes i i do i do <laughs> rake up leaves and mm -hmm. needles as well but uh it depends if it where it is in my yard how much if i want to put stuff that i buy that looks a little nicer uh, native garden is all raked up needles and leaves. Yeah. So uh, here's one I, I learned about this recently and I found that it was actually quite interesting. Someone put a question that said, I realize this is a little off subject, but my monarchs will chase off others out of the backyard. <laughs> is that normal? Yes. We're actually, we've actually learned that re a recent study, I wonder if I can find the link, but uh, a recent study we found that um, they actually can be pretty aggressive over uh, the host's plants. So they can chase off other monarchs. I was not aware of monarchs. that. <laughs> this is something I've learned within the past few weeks. Yeah, which I was like, oh, wow. You think of butterfly being nice and gentle, but actually <laughs> unbelievably uh, defensive. <laughs> So I'll see if I can find that link to that that research, but it's just okay. kind of a cool thing to learn that they can be rather defensive over yeah. their plants. <laughs> I've certainly seen that with birds, but I, I'll have to observe my monarchs more closely. Um, should we cut down pintas? Um, no, no. The only thing that we're really concerned about pent cutting down is the, the milkweed, like that tropical milkweed. Um, all other plants, you just kind of let them uh, die back with the season, or if you want to protect them, you can cover them. Um, the milkweed is the only one that we're concerned because of that. It's a, that the protozoa, a -O -O -E. O-E. Yeah. Um, so that's just the only one we're concerned about that we really, if you have chocolate milkweed, cut it back. All the other things, just kind of let them be. And pintas are wonder, wonderful, evergreen, and they'll be persistent mm -hmm. and you can get them flower almost year round long. So they're yep. great for a garden to help hold a garden together for structure throughout the year. Shoo, questions are coming in quicker than we can answer. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any uh, 
Oh, like I know you mentioned a lot of good plants that you really like for the shade or partial shade conditions. One that I really like uh, that you mentioned is the fire bush. That is one of my favorite plants. Oh, I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, I didn't show the video, <clears throat> excuse me, this time around, but um, I have a video of just being swarmed um, by butterflies on the fire bush. So it's one of my favorites. Yeah. Um, you know, the, like we have the cultivars, the lime sizzler, it's the dwarf yes, variety. Yes, we have one too, yeah. Yeah. Um, do you notice that it, does it attract um, pollinators just as I, well as I the I have native? not seen it as, as much as the native one. You know, That's I'm trying I it, I put yeah. one, but I have yet to, to really see the butterflies be attracted to it. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, I will, what I'm going to do is because we had a couple questions pop up, I'm going to send out just that, uh, that native nursery directory online so you can kind of look at what native nurseries are around you. Um, but it's important to mention that like when you're shopping from native nurseries, making sure that the plants are coming from uh, appropriate sources. Usually with native nurseries, it's not that big of a deal, but we have a lot of plants that are native plants that are um, that are commercially, what we call commercially exploited plants, mm -hmm. that they're harvested from native communities in order to be sold commercially. And that has a huge impact on the sure. essential native ecosystems. Um, so just making sure that the native plants that you're getting are coming from a reliable source will be very important, especially if you start thinking about, you know, what native plants you want to use for your butterfly garden. <laughs> so uh brazilian pepper so uh yes it's an unbelievably invasive species and it attracts it does attract butterflies very very well um you know which sometimes makes me think oh man that's awful that they attract that it's an invasive species that is attracting uh, pollinators with regards to maybe like nectar source. I'm not sure if it's a host source or not, but um, but still, you know, we think about all invasive species, it's offsetting our natural ecosystems. So the value of bringing in some pollinators to one specific plant, um, you're losing that benefit from that invasive species disrupting natural ecosystems. So it's better to get rid of all of the invasive species and try to bring in um, some of our native plant species or some of our other tough um, non-native but good strong uh, species that attract pollinators into yeah. the landscape. So Same right with plant, lantana. Right place. Yes. That, yeah. that was the other, one of the other, other mistakes I made, you know, I, I put in a lantana, then I took the master gardener program and uh, had to rip it out. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it was covered in butterflies and, and that's just it. I mean, it's a beautiful plant for butterflies, but it is invasive here in Florida. Mm -hmm. So we, what we'll do is we work we're starting to run out of time, but I know we're having still a bunch of questions come in. So um, what I want to do is I want to, I sent the link already, but we have a follow-up survey that we um, do with all of our programs and I put it in the chat box. So please take a couple minutes to fill that out. That's a great way that we use to help evaluate all of our programs to make sure that our programs are constantly evolving and developing. Um, so if, please take a few minutes uh, to fill that out. Um, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to stop our live feed. Okay. Um, right. And thank you. I'll stop the recording. So thank you everybody for joining us and we'll still answer some of these questions um, as we move forward, but it's going to stop all the main stuff. Right. So thank you, Carol, for the presentation. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye.